Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so glad that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do so is to like us on Facebook. We post all sorts of information there. And don't forget that there's an audio version of this message on Apple Podcasts. Just search the Foundry Church. With that said, let's dive into our Advent series called Expecting. Isn't Mary engaged to Joseph? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Since... I am a virgin. Did you hear about Mary's condition? Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary, Mary, I believe you. The angel told me not to be afraid to take you home as my wife. What is conceived in you is from the Holy Spirit. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. For us the child is born, for us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Well, hey, Foundry Church. It's good to be with you today. And I'm excited because we're in week three um, of our series. We're talking about Everlasting Father tonight. And here's... One of the things that um, just preparing this, I thought of. I remember being a little boy on road trips, and I have this this image in my head. It's one of my favorite views from my childhood. Um, I guess I must have sat behind my mom in the back seat of the car because I can remember on road trips, my dad always had this band of light when we were driving at night across his eyes. Anybody else ever remember wearing that? Seeing their that anybody? Nope, just me being weird. Um, so I was little. I was not hyper intelligent and remain so. And um, I remember thinking, like, how does he get light goggles, right? And I, I used to just, like, stare at him. And I remember when I figured it out, like, well, that's the cars behind us, the reflection on the rearview mirror, putting a, that awesome little, like, you know, kind of the dyslexic Batman mask on. And uh, it was really cool. And I remember seeing this, and I remember falling asleep in the car because my family was um, from do, two different places in the States. My dad was raised in the Central Valley of California. My mom was raised in Western Colorado. So we would go to one place or the other on vacation, and we did a lot of road tripping that way. And I loved uh, going on road trips. And and I loved as a kid what it was like when you fell asleep in the car. Anybody like car naps? Oh, oh, sweet like honey, aren't they? Because you're on the road and, you know, you're, you get a little tired and you doze off and then you wake up, you're like 100 miles down the road. And I remember how my dad always knew the way. He always knew where we were going. He always knew the way. And I'd wake up and I'd be like, Dad, where are we? And he would start barking out things that were we were near. Oh, you know, we're out by St. George, Utah. We're right on the border where you go through that little northern part of Arizona and then dip into Nevada. He would tell me there's a gas station up ahead or this is where we stop and we eat at Denny's or, or whatever. He knew the way and he always seemed to know where we were going. I could fall asleep and wake up and I didn't fall asleep thinking, oh, I hope we don't get lost. I fell asleep knowing for sure that my dad was going to get us where we were going. He took care of me the whole way. He made sure we were safe. 
And he got us there. And I love that image for this because he knew the way. And he was so confident in it. And when you're a little kid, and this is the problem, when we grow up, we forget what it was like to be dependent. What it was like to not know the way, but be in the, be in the care of someone who did. And here's the thing. I love knowing that my dad knew the way, but here's where this tweaks a little. There's a theological reality that took place in the life of the disciples, the men who walked with Christ, that um, echoes that, that sense of like dependence. And we find it in John chapter 14, the gospel of John uh, chapter 14. And what we see there is Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And in this conversation, by the way, John chapter 14 is really quickly becoming one of my favorite texts in all of scripture. And Jesus is talking with his disciples and he's having this conversation. And Thomas, the disciple, pipes up and says this to Jesus. This is what it said in John 14, 5 to 10. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how do we know the way to get there? We don't know where you're going. How do we know the way to get there? One of my very favorite um, verses and comments of Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you know him and you have seen him. Philip chimes in and says, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. Just show us the Father. And Jesus answers, don't you know me, Philip? Don't you know me? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father? I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. So Jesus is making this kind of distinction for the disciples to understand And live in the tension of how do we get there? How do we get there, Jesus, when you're not there? How do we we make this switch to we know how to get there? Because it is weird sometimes when I'll be driving, and I like to drive through the night because there's no traffic, the big cities are quiet, and we'll be driving, and one of the kids wakes up and says, where are we? And I know where we are, and it's like a flashback in my head. I'm now the guy wearing the the rearview mirror mask, and I'm driving, and I'm telling him where we're going, and I'm confident, and I don't remember when that switch happened. I just know it has happened. And the tension of going from how do we get there to knowing for sure how we do indeed arrive. And Jesus is giving his disciples some understanding on this and really leaning into them and giving them an understanding of how we get to the Father, how we get back to him who we broke relationship with when we sinned. In Isaiah chapter 9, one of the names given to God, the Messiah, this, this promised Savior, was Everlasting Father. For unto us a son is born. For unto us a child is, or a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And he shall be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, right? Everlasting father is the term that is given for the person of Jesus Christ. The only son of God is also father. So there's this weird kind of play where you're going, well, wait a minute. Is he the son or is he the father? And we need to look at this and understand that there is a nuance going on within this that um, 700 years before Christ would walk the earth, there is promises of the Messiah's identity being given. But here's one of the really cool parts. In this Isaiah 9 passage are little Easter eggs theological Easter eggs that we get to see that even Isaiah didn't understand when he promised a wonderful counselor. He didn't realize that was an Easter egg. When he promised an everlasting father, I don't think he realized there was an Easter egg, a hidden theological truth in that, that Jesus Christ would reveal because this is what we know. When we first talked about Jesus as wonderful counselor, we talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. Remember that? We talked about the Holy Spirit. And what we realized is that Jesus Christ would give to us the Holy Spirit by his blood 
and his life, death, and resurrection, he would give us a covenant that would redeem us and then give us an advocate, a Holy Spirit, a wonderful counselor. And it was like a hidden truth within the prophetic promise that because of Jesus, a spirit would be given to you and I that we could lean on and depend on. Quite literally, the name of it in Greek was paraclete. There's this term called paraclete, the spirit of Christ. And the spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ, teaches about Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God always points to Jesus Christ. It teaches about him, it reveals him, and it glorifies him. It's kind of a cool reality. And it's an Easter egg that was given to us in this Isaiah passage. And so is the the term everlasting father. It is another nuance that says this. God is revealing himself as triune. We call it the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you see them at play in Isaiah 9 as fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus points us back to our everlasting Father. He takes us back to the eternal Father and gives us relationship with Him. But don't just think that the everlasting Father aspect only deals with Father God. It actually, there is a reality of it that wrestles in the I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know the best way to say it. It kind of wrestles in the tension that Jesus Christ is the father of our salvation. He brought it to us. He gave it to us. He has, in a way, sired it into the world and given it to us. He is the father. You, many people say he's the author of salvation, the author of redemption. He is the father of our redemption. We are all connected to our Heavenly Father because of what Jesus gave us. So we can look at this and understand when, when Isaiah promises that there will be this Messiah who is an everlasting Father. It's Easter egging. It's a, it's a hidden surprise that says you are going to be reconnected by the Messiah to the everlasting Father. He is going to give you something that can't be taken away. He's going to connect you in such a way that you will realize when Jesus says to Philip, don't you know that I and the Father are one? That we're the very same? That what I'm doing isn't of my own authority, but I'm doing it. I'm speaking the words he gives me. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. We are one. So we we see the Father most clearly when we see the Son. Jesus is the very best reflection of who the Father is, which I think is one of the most gracious gifts that could be given to us. Because if we saw God, I think we would turn to dust. I don't think we could comprehend him. When Isaiah saw God, he said, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And he fell down, whop, dead. Like fell down on the ground like he was dead. And the angel put a hot coal on his lips and stood him back up right? We couldn't stand in the presence of God, but we can understand the heart and the character of who our Heavenly Father is by looking at the person of Jesus, because people we get. We can understand people, because we're surrounded by them all the time. So he put Jesus into bodily form, and Jesus is the best reflection of the character and the nature of our Heavenly Father. So I want to unpack all of this really in two different kind of legs. I want to look at everlasting father as two separate words. Everlasting. Everlasting. It has this this sense of perpetuity to it. It goes on and on and on without ending. Some kids in church are like, oh yeah, every Sunday it goes on and on and on without ending. And you sit and you pray that it would just be over quick. Right? I remember when I was little, I just loved it when the pastor would be like, and my final point, and I was like, please make it a short one, right? I was so excited. It felt like it was everlasting. If you are a Broncos fan or a Lions fan, this has been a a season that is everlasting agony, right? Just shame upon shame. And you're just sitting there going, oh, just get it over with. Just get it over with already. It feels everlasting. But there is this nature of God, this eternality of God that we need to understand and grab onto because God in Jesus Christ makes some very big statements about his identity. 
about his eternal nature. In Revelation, it says this, Jesus speaking to John, the one who wrote the books of John and the gospel of John, and also John is the revelator, the one who uh, received the revelation, the last book of the Bible. Uh, Jesus is speaking to John in Revelation, and Jesus says this. He, he makes a statement of who he is. He says, I am. Now, this is like this is like a protein shake for your spirit. Like, this will beef you up a little. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end, right? I am the one who was, who is, and is to come. I am. So we'll take that for a second. In the book of Exodus, when Moses encounters Almighty God at the burning bush, and he says to God, how do I know who to tell people who sent me to tell Pharaoh who sent me to him? God said, tell him this. Tell him I am that I am. So when Jesus makes the statement, I am, he's saying, don't forget, I am the eternal God of all time. I am God, eternal, unending without beginning and without end. So Jesus says, I am the one who was, is, and is to come. I am everlasting. I always was, and I always will be. When we look at that, we understand this nature of being without end. We understand that Jesus Christ is not subservient to the bonds of time. He is outside of time. He is eternal. Before there was time, there was the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they created everything. So the first word of creation we know to be Jesus Christ. The last word of creation is going to be the trumpet call of Jesus Christ. And when time comes to an end, God will not come to an end with it. It will continue on in eternity. He is everlasting without beginning, without end. And we understand more of who Jesus is when he says the everlasting father, when that prophecy is made, that everlasting nature of God is given to us and we can cling to our Lord and Savior in such a way knowing that he is not ever going to come to an end. We are never going to be left without him. He is eternal. He is everlasting. He is in very nature God. And there is a hope and a bedrock in that that tells us this. If you ever are in a time of upheaval and pain and loss, I can tell you this. You can always go back to the one who knows beginning from end. The everlasting great I am. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who has given us access to the Heavenly Father. When we look at this, we understand that this is, like, big. When you think of everlasting, I want you to think of, like, 380-pound offensive tackle, big, right, big. And if it came running at you, like, I just want to die first. Like, you don't want that to hit you. Big, as big as it gets, huge, powerful, this word, this phrase, this everlasting, unconquerable, amazing thing is God. It's everlasting. It will not know an ending. It's big. It's strong. It's unbreakable. And then he gives us another term, Father. Now, I want to say something real quick. I think it's important to say it. There are those of us in this room who have had abuses and hurts poured into our lives by fathers in this world. And I'm not speaking of them. That is a broken model of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your heavenly father tonight. If your father was someone who hurt you and harmed you, I am so sorry, but that is not who we're talking about. We're talking about a God who loves you and proved his love by giving what mattered most to him for you to be in relationship. So when we talk tonight about Father, we do so in the closest and most intimate kind of terms. I don't know about you, but I loved when my kids were little and I would come home and there would be one who was in the jabbering phase. Anybody like the jabbering phase? Where they're just sitting there and they're just like, and they're like blowing bubbles. And you're like, that is nasty and doesn't look intelligent. But you love it, right? It's this cute little thing going on. And then they start making the noise. Da, 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 
da, da, da, da, da. And their toys are da, da, da. And when they see you, like da, 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 da. And they talk to you, and they, everything's kind of that weird, kind of bouncy. It's what their little mouths can form as they learn to talk. And it's the da, 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 you know, and they talk like that. They have this weird little kind of diction among them that's this bouncy, happy little way. It's the da, 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 da. It's intimate. I loved picking up my little kids. When they'd see me and they'd be like, oh, da-da. You know, you pick them up and you hold on to them. It was so much fun watching them play with stuff and saying it or calling you and showing you something with this inquisitive look. Like, da-da. And you're like, I oh, know, that's awesome. That's dirt. And you would talk about it. It was great. I love that. Right? I want you to hear this from Galatians 4, 6, from Romans 8, 15. There's a term given to us that stands on the polar opposite end of everlasting, eternal God is Abba. Abba. Right? Like, sounds like grandpa, doesn't it? Papa, bop, bop, bumpa. Grandpa, right? It's got this baba kind of sound. Abba, dada, close. So close, you know them intimately. And in Galatians, the Apostle Paul says to us, you, by your adoption, you were given sonship. You were made a child, an heir. And by that adoption, you can call out, Abba, Father. For Paul to call God Abba is as mind-boggling as possible. I don't have a good parallel for it because Paul was a devout Jew who writing the name of God, the I am name, the, the Hebrew name for that, they would have thrown away the quill after writing the um, shortened version of it because it was such a holy name. Paul would have never thought it was okay as a good Hebrew to call God Abba. But Jesus taught him something. Paul says, by your adoption, you can call Abba. Paul says to the Roman church, it is by the adoption you've received into Jesus Christ that you've been given the rights as family. You can cry out, Abba, Father. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, we find Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's sitting there and he's getting ready to go to the cross. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be like like thrown away emotionally by crowds of people, spit on, mocked, abused. His mom's going to see it. His heart is breaking. He falls on his, pl- on his face before God and he says, Dad, please, anything but this. Anything but this. Now, if you're a parent out there and if you're a dad, does your kid have a way of saying your name that all your radars go off? Like when, when my kids call me and they're like, Dad, what's up? Anything I'm doing stops. Because I know there's a certain break in Josh's voice where I know I need to attend to him. What's up? I'll get up out of a meeting, walk out of it. I, I always take the call when my kids call. I don't care. It's probably rude and bad business, but that's just life. And, I, and I'm like, what's up? When I hear that tone, it gets my attention. When I hear a, a fall and then they call me, I'm like, oh, what, what happened, right? And you, they get your attention. There is a tone my daughter Bella uses. Daddy, I will burn this town to the ground to find out what that was. Like, what? who wronged you, right? Because there is a tone of Abba that they can call to me. And they are like sewn into my soul. They're my kids. They're, they're my kids, There's something about them, and we are given Abba, provider, protector. Jesus Christ gives us this deep, sticky, sweet, intimate language that changes everything. We have everlasting. We get the almighty everlasting God, but do we understand Abba? Man, it makes me think of my grandparents, my granddads. Those two guys couldn't have been more different. My granddad Cox, he was a great guy. I remember him like he was real clean shaven, wore a suit every day, just a solid guy, bigger than the world to me. And I loved being at his house in the morning because uh, he would be unshaven. And I'd rub his cheek and he'd stick his chin out and we would talk. 
you know, he would shine my tennis shoes. He shined his shoes every morning. He was the, like, total, like, most classic, like, American businessman I can remember. He'd shine his shoes in the morning. Then he'd go shave, and he'd do his things. I was so close. I know the smell of my granddad. I can still, it's been 20-some years since I saw him last. I can still smell his aftershave. Abba. My grandpa, Folkers, was a much more quiet, he was a Dutchman. He didn't scream if he was on fire. Right? Every morning he got up, put on his brown robe, and read the Fresno Bee. And if I was there, I could climb up underneath the paper and sit there and try to get to the cartoon pages. And he'd kind of fold it back, and I would talk to him. I'd play with his mustache. I know the smell of my Grandpa Folker's aftershave, too. He had a bald head. I got to rub it. You don't do that unless that's your grandpa, right? That's grandpa. Somebody comes up and rubs my head, I'm going to be like, You don't just touch people on the head, right? Because there's intimacy involved. There's closeness. If you know how I smell, we need to see a therapist, right? Abba, close, close, intimate, connected, loved, known, and knowing, everlasting Father. Jesus Christ gave us an image of certainty of authority and of power and of tenderness, of closeness and safety. We could run to him. He's Abba. We could always depend back on him. We know him to be good. Our everlasting father. Jesus is called in Isaiah 9, everlasting father. He is the author and the father of our salvation, but he also restores us in relationship to our heavenly father. So here's the cool thing. I love that my dad knew the way to get, knew how to get places. He knew the way, but Jesus doesn't know the way. Jesus is the way. He simply is the way. There's no way to to parse this out any differently. Jesus isn't Google Maps for your soul. Jesus is the only way. He is the way to get back to the Father. He's the way to the Father. He has sealed for you and for me an eternal relationship bound up in his blood and his willing sacrifice that literally screams into eternity that God thought eternity without you was unbearable. So he sent his son, Abba. When we look at that and we realize who Jesus Christ is and what he revealed about God the Father, we can say this, that God the Father is a gift to you and I. Our everlasting Father is a gift to you and I given to us by Jesus Christ. He is the very means by which we gain access back to the Father. But here's the thing. There are some of us who are enduring this life to get to the Father. He is not, he is not the someday Father. He is the everlasting Father. He is the one who was, he is the one who is, and he is the one who is to come. Which means this. Your life presently, today, has a mandate on it to walk the good roads and the rough roads with Abba. He is present. He is fully present in your life right now. We have the Father right now. Jesus is the way, but we can be in right relationship with our Heavenly Father today. And I don't think we often realize that that everlasting, almighty God of the everlasting part of the Father is ours to claim and hold on to, but we also get to snuggle up close to Abba, the everlasting, almighty, powerful God Father, who loves us and is close to us. Many of us might not know the intimacy of a close relationship with our Father, but that's no excuse not to pursue it with God. Because in Jesus Christ, he told us to do one thing. Expect me in your life every day. Expect me. Do we ever expect the Father heart of God to move us to act? To move us to feel something? Or are we so bound to the grind we live that we forget, you and I forget to expect the almighty God of the universe, the eternal God of the universe who said, call me Dada. Call me the most intimate, close name you can. You can come climb up close to me. I can't imagine what it was like for my granddads when I got too big to crawl on their lap. 
I can't imagine because I always did when I saw him. And then we hit those weird teenage years where I became awesome. And then it turns out I super wasn't, but that's okay. I figured that out later. But how sad it must have been because I think they probably expected it. So what if we get over ourselves and we go crawling up onto dad's lap in this Christmas season? And we don't have to be the big, strong mom or dad or whoever we are, whatever role we play in this life. We don't have to be the one who has it together. We get to run to the one who is our everlasting almighty, Abba. Abba, who will take our heartaches and our cries for affection close to heart and will hold us near. I invite you this season, this week, to look expectantly to look expectantly for a God who has longed to walk closely with you. He'll provide opportunities. I guarantee you this. My granddad still got ready the same way when I was older. It was me who walked away. It was me. And I won't lie. Even in my mid-40s, I would give a lot to have one more morning. I would give a lot to have one more chance to climb up close. And I can scarcely imagine what it'll be like on that great day when I finally see God, when we finally see God face to face. I hope that I know the sound of his voice. I hope that I know the smell of his movement in this world, the fragrance of the move of Christ. I hope that I know him well and that getting on his lap is as comfortable as taking my next breath. That is my hope. That is an expectant life, knowing that we are loved by the everlasting Abba. Make no mistake, in this life you are loved by an everlasting Father who proved his love for you in the very person of Jesus Christ so that you would never have to be in eternity without him. Lord Jesus Christ, we your church today, we step back from all the busyness, and we just pray, come, Lord Jesus, speak to us who are frail and have short memories. Speak to us and remind us of what it is to just get up close with Abba, to share our fears, our hopes, our dreams, to maybe cry out if we're in need in a voice that gets Dad's attention, but may we never get lost in the in the rigor and the formality of religion that says we can only speak to you as God in this huge almighty thing when you said also call me dad. So today, God, we come home like children who maybe have not done everything right, but we need to be in the safety of our heavenly father. Today, God, we come home to dad's house and we ask, would you speak a word to comfort, encourage, and glorify Jesus Christ out of these lives we live. We pray it all in his name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of what we call our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry, so make sure you check that out. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again next week.